People's expectations of the office have changed. Now what people want is- Gabby Hersham. She's the visionary co-founder of Huckletree, workspaces for ambitious minds and big thinkers. Gabby is here to show you how the right workspace can ignite curiosity, fuel creativity, and propel innovation. They're coming into the office. If they're leaving their homes, their children, their comforts behind, it better be for a damn good office. We want to build the world's most exciting innovation ecosystem, but we also want it to be the world's most inclusive. Can't avoid talking about COVID. Can I swear? <laughs> yeah, go for it. It was a shit period of time. As an entrepreneur, you're only as good as your last success. What does leadership mean to you? Welcome back to Anatomy of a Leader with me, Maria Vorostovsky. You did it. You got the show to 1,000 subscribers. And if you're a regular and you haven't subscribed yet, hit that subscribe button. Let's get to 2,000 subscribers. And I promise you, I'll get even more amazing guests. Let's do it. Gabby, welcome to Anatomy of a Leader. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you. I'm so happy to be here. Yes, and I'm very, very pleased to have you on the show. We met many years ago when actually I had a startup and I was working in Huckletree, which is your business, putting together amazing startups on office space where kind of technology masterminds meet creatives and you just create these wonderful ecosystems where people can collaborate and come up with new ideas. So I love that focus on curiosity. And I believe that you have described yourself as passionately curious. Where does that come from for you? Okay, so it's a good, it's a great question and actually a really great story to start with. So one of my best friends who is called Musa Tarek, he lives over in the States and he's had an incredible career in marketing. Um, he had on his, one of his bios many years ago, something to the likes of, I have no particular skills, but I'm just passionately curious. And it kind of stuck with me. Like, I feel that that is really true of, of myself as a leader, I'm a generalist. So I'm not necessarily deeply skilled in one area, but I'm curious enough to get under the rug of many different areas. So it just, it rang true. And curiosity, as you say, is such a key part of what we're building at Huckletree, because if you're there, you're curious about the world, you want to meet the other people around you, you want to engage. Curiosity, it's beautiful. But curiosity is a skill. It's a very important skill. Well, it keeps us young right? Like I often think about children and how curious they are and the questions that my kids ask me and they see a puppy walking down the street and they just want to play with it. They're curious about this puppy. I love that. Mm. I think if we can kind of embody and keep that approach to life, that curiosity is so beautiful. Mm. It's also about recognizing that you don't have all the answers. So if I take that approach and I put it into a business context, other CEOs, other business leaders might be afraid to ask questions. They might be afraid to show their blind spots, you know, afraid to show that they don't have all the answers. But for me, I'm always sitting in meetings and asking questions because if I don't know something, I need to know it. And I have no ego about it. I'm not the expert. I am the generalist. I am the person that has br brought the team together that has the vision, but I have my experts across my team. There are lots of people that are experts in their field. They're gonna have the answers that I don't. So I think being okay with asking the questions not only shows that you're curious about the world, about the people around you and that you can engage in conversation, but also shows your strength as a leader. Mm. So what does leadership mean to you? That's a good question. I think for me, it means, um, well, it means lots of things, first of all, and I, I would find it quite hard to define. But I think when I think of a leader of a business, the first thing that I think of is um, somebody who can set the vision and explain the vision and get people on board to that vision or the mission. So that's the first thing. I think if a, if a leader fails to do that, they're probably not a great leader. And that also, by the way, extends to leaders of countries. You know, you're rallying people, you're, you're setting the vision, the expectations for what you want your country to become and where the country is going into the future, et cetera. And you, when I say that, I'm automatically thinking of great leaders around the world and others that are less great. So I think for me, leadership is really about, this is our vision and bringing people on that journey. Mm. You mentioned some of the great leaders, like who do you think is a great leader? Well, I mean, I don't really wanna get into politics, mm. but definitely, you know, as I say, I'm thinking about leaders that are visionary and that are transforming their countries. Um, 
so in terms of leaders of countries, you're asking, um, it's this is very, very divisive. Um, and definitely, you know, there's no one that I can say that, you know, everybody is going to like and everybody is going to go along with. But there are elements of different leaders around the world that you would pick up on and you would say, wow, I really see what they're doing there. So, for example, you know, Saudi Arabia, what they're building, what they're building with Neom, how they are really advancing the country. You, you recognize that there is leadership there and that there is a vision to take that country to the next step. And I admire that. Um, and likewise with many other countries around the world. Take me back to the moment before Huckle Tree was conceptualized. It was just a, an idea in your head. Talk me through that moment. I was living in New York and I was actually working at a very early WeWork. I think one of the first WeWorks actually. And I had spent the, the, the previous year and a half working in film production with one other person in their apartment in the West Village in New York. And it was very lonely. And it also just wasn't very um, energizing at all. So all of a sudden we started hearing about these kind of shared work offices. There wasn't really even a term for it. And I put on my Facebook page, which I now don't have Facebook anymore. So it just shows you how much has changed over the past sort of 15 years. Does anyone know of one of those kind of shared office things? And we found ourselves at this WeWork and I was like, amazing. There are all these people here. We were making this film this feature film. And I remember in the, in the, in the space of a very short time, when we moved into this office, we met somebody who did the graphic design for one of the first posters and somebody who became the first entertainment lawyer and somebody who put money into the development budget of the film. And I just thought, how cool, you know, you go from working in a tiny place, not inspiring at all to working somewhere, which is inspiring, energizing, social, actually conducive to advancing the business. Um, and I loved it. And it felt like I was kind of back in a cool high school. So I loved that idea. And I moved back to London because my boyfriend at the time dumped me, um, <laughs> which turned out to be <laughs> the best thing that's ever happened to me. But um, when he did, uh, I kind of spent another few months in New York and then ended up moving home. It was just the right time for me to move back home. And I still had this love for this idea that I had come across in New York and moved back to London and thought, hey, hold on, there is this explosion of entrepreneurship happening in the UK at the moment, the epicenter of that being in London and specifically in, you know, Silicon Roundabout and Shoreditch and East London. And there are a few co-working spaces, but there aren't that many. And there isn't one that's specifically servicing this group of people, you know, the, the entrepreneurs, the innovators, the tech businesses that, you know, the businesses that were rapid growth. And that's what I wanted to do. So I, um, put my kind of thoughts down, built my business plan, um, making it all sound really easy, but I had no idea what I was doing. So it took me quite a while and I leveraged a lot of support from the people around me. Um, and raised my seed round of funding, which was really, really hard. I'm sure we'll go into it at some mm. point, but not for now. And, but ultimately anyway, launched our first space. And for me, the vision was, and still is, and there's, there's a lot of things that tie into the vision, but the main thing is we want to create a home for innovation. So we're building these hubs, you know, we're at the moment, we've got about 300,000 square feet, London, Manchester, and Dublin, soon to have, um, 13 hubs, 11 of which in London and all for the innovation sector. So you know, you don't need to be a tech business. You don't need to be a creative. You can be anything, but you have to be doing something innovative. And the magic that happens when we put these businesses, these individuals, their employees together is really, it's really incredible to see. It's energizing. I can't believe there are so many because when I was working on my startup, I don't remember how many years it was. What is it? Seven years ago now? Where were you at Shoreditch? The one, Finsbury Square. Yes, Shoreditch. You have no idea how excited I was every single day going in. Yeah, well, that's it the was, goal. That's how I felt. That's it was the such goal. a wonderful space in terms of like how it looked, how it was set up. There were events happening. It was very different to the offices at the time. And the one thing I remember is that the people working there, they were very focused but they were also friendly in the way that you can approach people, you can talk to them. And I really remember that. That was such a big differentiator. And yeah, I loved it. 
really loved it. It's a friendly vibe. I think that's what, you know, I was saying lots of things feed into the mission. So, you know, another thing that's really important to us is that we want to build the world's most exciting innovation ecosystem, but we also want it to be the world's most inclusive innovation ecosystem. And inclusive means so many different things to different people. But a part of that is that people are friendly. You know, people, and this starts from our team, our teams who are there, that they include everyone, they stop for a chat, they say hi, they genuinely take an interest in how your day is going. We Mm -hmm. actually just um, got our most recent member surveys back and I read all of the submissions and all of the the messages and the comments. And there were so many comments kind of naming out individual team members. And one of them that's in my mind right now is, was speaking about a particular team team member of ours at Oxford Circus and saying that they, you know, their little gesture of always kind of stopping with the members and saying, hey, would you rather this or that? You know, whatever it's about, it's probably funny and a joke and, you know, one can only imagine. But actually how far that goes to just making your day that little bit better. Mm. So I love those stories. Mm. And I'm happy that you think that the people were friendly. and Why did you want to service that niche, entrepreneurs and innovators? Because I find it fascinating. I find it exciting. I find it great to be around, you know, other entrepreneurs as an entrepreneur myself to learn from them. And actually a really key thing that we're seeing now as we migrate from being what we were seven years ago, which was much more for kind of the early stage startups to what we are today post COVID, which is, Hey, we're creating these offices that look a little bit psychedelic, but really attract employees back to work and that really appeals to much larger businesses is that the friendly nature is still there it's in our dna but that it's more than that it's more like your employees by virtue of osmosis by virtue of working alongside so many other people from other businesses their peers and other businesses who are so motivated and 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 willed to succeed that rubs off and that creates this atmosphere where everybody is innovating working smartly instead of working hard, but doing things different and just really, really ambitiously. Mm. So talk me through about this working smart versus working hard, because this is something that I have definitely struggled with. And many entrepreneurs talk about the early stages of, of their businesses where you kind of can't avoid working really, really hard. And when you ask people, say, well, could you have succeeded if you were not putting in that much effort in? And quite often they kind of pause and stop. And I don't necessarily think they even have the right answer because they've only known one way. But talk to me about your your experience in terms of working smart versus working hard. It's a good question that definitely in the early days when you're building a business, you know, it's it's hard and it's grueling and you're not going to come up for a lot of air, 100%. Um, but I think generally speaking, when I think about my team, I don't think about, I want everybody to be in the office at, you know, the first, first thing in the morning and leave last thing at night. There's a reality of us running spaces, which is that we need to deliver that service from, you know, certain hours during the daytime. But, um, other than that, I want people to have balance and I want people to enjoy their lives. For me, that's about my children. For someone else, it might be about something else as long as people are delivering on their targets. So as long as my team members are, you know, delivering what we set out for them to do, what we create together as their plan for the quarter, it doesn't matter to me so much about their hours. And that's really what I mean about working smartly and not, and not, you know, working. I mean, we all work hard. Maybe Mm. that's not the right term, but it's not about kind of, you know, clocking in the hours. It's about what is the outcome? What is the Mm. output? Mm. That's what I care about. Your business is focused on office space and can't avoid talking about COVID, how obviously that's impacted lots of companies. First of all, talk me through what that period of time was for your business. And then I'll ask a follow on question in terms of the lessons and the purpose of the office. Can I swear? (laughs) Yeah, go for it. (laughs) It was a shit period of time, but look for everyone. You know, I definitely wasn't alone. You know, everybody kind of faced huge difficulties in so many ways during that moment in time. But um, for Huckletree, so for me from a kind of work perspective, I think 
there were the realities of um, the team, which we had to deal with, furlough, redundancies, engagement levels when we were all working from home. You know, these were all complete realities of the day, as as we all well know. Then there, there was also the reality of the business. And I think from very early on, what we tried to do was move our mindset away from revenue, 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 growth, growth, growth to our members. What do our members need? How can we support them? And how can we still be a crucial asset to them in a time where they actually don't need office space? And in that mindset shift, I think we actually managed to um, do reasonably well, as well as we could have done during that period, because it was about how can we help you? You know, we had at the time about 300 businesses in our ecosystem who were also going through so many you know, difficult moments. So that was kind of our approach and our strategy. Um, to see us through the period. Mm -hmm. It was probably the industry in the world that was one of the most affected mm -hmm. by COVID. We were definitely impacted. And you see the kind of aftermath of, of, of commercial real estate in city centers around the world that previously used to be, you know, at full occupancy. And now there's, there's, there are high vacancy levels, mm -hmm. but I think it's, it's shifted the balance potentially for the better. Mm -hmm. And what I mean by that is that we do, the expectations are different now. It's not about clocking the hours, as I was talking about before, coming in Monday to Friday, you know, for, for many people, that's not a reality for so many different reasons. And I think that we have more balance now, that it's more acceptable now to work from home. You know, I personally, I'm a big believer in working from the office. It's my, it's my work, it's my job, but I'm also a sociable being and I'm energized by being around other people. Um, but I'm also a big believer in, it doesn't have to be five days a week. Mm. I think there's a balance to be mm. had. So I think for me, ideation, coming up with those groundbreaking ideas, being a business that stays ahead of the curve. You know, you were saying that in Shoreditch at the time, our office space looked so different. Well, we need to constantly, you know, you're only as good as your last innovation, right? My cousin actually said that recently on a panel and it really stuck with me. As an entrepreneur, you're only as good as your last success. Mm. So every new building that we do, we have to make sure that it is ahead of the curve and that everybody still thinks about it, how you thought about Shoreditch seven years ago. Do you feel like as a result of COVID that you had to work harder, smarter and figure out a space that is even better than what you were doing before? hundred percent. People's expectations of the office have changed. So before the offices that were acceptable, cool, yes, we'll come here before. And I'm not necessarily speaking about Huckletree, I'm speaking about commercial real estate in general are no longer acceptable. Now what people want is a hospitality experience. If they're coming into the office, if they're leaving their homes, their children, their comforts behind, and they are schlepping across town on public transport, it better be for a damn good office right? We want gyms in our spaces. We want beautiful buildings. We want energy efficient buildings. We want net zero. We want retail. We want F and B opportunities. We don't want to be at a cubicle. We want lots of different areas to work from at any given moment. Mm -hmm. We want to invite our kind of top VIP clients or guests or whoever to the office and then be wowed by the experience also. So it's completely shifted from how it was before COVID. But again, I think that's a really positive thing because the onus now is on us to create these experiences that make people happy to come to work. And that's what I want to do. So we can't be lackluster about it anymore. Have any companies reached out to you asking for recommendations or advice about how they can improve their offices? Yes, a lot. So obviously, because we have about 10 years, coming up to 10 years in the game now, and we know kind of what works in mm -hmm. terms of, you know, what you could build that's like a nice to have perk, but that people won't actually use and what you can offer and build in terms of amenity space that actually will get used and will be a genuine kind of meaningful element to a workspace. So we do have inquiries specifically from the larger, obviously, businesses who are building out these large floor plans. But what I'm also really interested in is the trend that a lot of them actually don't want to go and take their own, you know, long term space anymore. So they'd rather kind of offset that, offset the need to sign up to 10, 15 years in London, which is still very much, you know, out, out lengthens. That's not even a word, but you know, the leases in London are much longer than, mm -hmm. than we would see in Paris, in Berlin, which, which typically are kind of five, you know, even less years in London. It's like 10, around 10 years, maybe longer. So as a business, you're coming in and you have to say, I'm going to sign up to this for 10 years. 
there's more than likely not going to be any kind of break or get out clause. And I need to know how many employees I'm going to have in 10 years time. Mm -hmm. I'm stuck here. There's no flexibility. Plus I have to spend money on fitting out the space at the beginning, which I can tell you in today's world, given everything that's happened, it is expensive to fit out a space nicely from, you know, if you take a building on from a landlord and they've delivered it to kind of cat a, which is basically empty for you to then come in and do your thing, but it's got all of its services and facilities in it. You're looking at 150 pounds a foot minimum to deliver a nice space. So, you know, a space of 10,000 square feet, which is not that large is a million and a half, mm. right? It's so a it's a lot. It's a lot to make a space look nice. m and &E costs a lot. Partitioning costs a lot. Beautiful spaces cost a lot of money. Finishings cost a lot of money. Why would businesses do that when actually they can just come to a workspace operator? And there are so many of us. In fact, London is the world's um, biggest epicenter of, of flexible workspace. And we do it for you. And we create a beautiful experience and you have all the events that we put on for your employees so that your employees are engaged and they come to the office and they can meet all these other people. Mm. It just feels like that's really outdated. What do you think is holding some companies back from actually going down that road and saying, you know what, we don't want to have that 10 year lease and you just want to have a more flexible space that's more innovative? I don't think it is holding companies back. It's not. There's a massive shift that's happening where companies are reducing the size of their least footprint and going more into flexible options. So you think this is now the trend? A hundred percent. This is the future. And you can see it if you read the real estate reports, re read the kind of real estate market reports of, of London, of the city of London and what's happening. Commercial real estate, you know, the vacancies are much higher and the people that the businesses that are coming and taking the long term positions are the flexible workspace companies. Mm. So it's a hundred percent the trend. It's what's happening in front of our eyes. Um, and ultimately, back to your question about COVID, it was a terrible moment in time. But from very early on, we thought, hey, if we can just figure out our cash flow so that we don't die during this period, at the end of this period, the whole world is going to change. And for our industry, it might change in a very positive way. Mm -hmm. So take me to that moment when it's happened and you're like, what does this mean? Like, what's going on? What was going through your mind? Well, before I had that thought, <laughs> it was it was not great my mind wasn't in a great place but as soon as I realized that and I can't remember at which point I did but as soon as I did realize that and I'm an eternal optimist so if I have a vision or have a thought or have an idea I hold on to it you know that drives me forward so as soon as I realized that actually people businesses weren't going to be tying themselves up to long-term leases and would be much more turning towards flexible workspace once the pandemic would end it was great, but the reality was I had no idea how long the pandemic would last for. And I had a reality of how much cash runway we had. So it got me through emotionally, but obviously we needed to put the right tactics and measures in place across the business to ensure our survival. The thing is, it was in my mind, but for me to then sell that dream to the team was a very different story because not everybody is wired the way I am. I am such an optimist, but it's harder to bring people along for that journey when you know, they, they're not wired in the same way. What was it like with the team? It was, um, first of all, it was really challenging because we were all at home. I'm really sorry. I hate working from home. I don't think a great business was ever built in a silo. I think that businesses that are completely remote, I just, I factually don't understand how that works. So mm -hmm. it was depressing. It was really depressing. Um, fundamentally because we weren't in the same room. And also because everybody had their own shit that they were going through. You know, we were all really worried about our loved ones, as we all were, about our jobs, about my business. You know, everybody had their own concerns. So I think it was worrying. And as a leader who has to make the decisions about redundancies and furloughs, that's never a fun place to be in. That's just never fun. You know, you build a business, you build friendships, you work with people for years and years. And these are realities. It's not just about COVID. You know, these are realities that happen all the time in business. Now we're in an environment where every business around the world is making these decisions. Mm. You have to, and it is your responsibility as a leader to prioritize the business over the relationships that you've built. But that's something that I've struggled with a lot. If someone's building a space from scratch, what are the top five things do they need to think about? Are you taking an office space? <laughs> Do you want my tips? <laughs> no, I'm kidding. <laughs> um, 
what do they need to think about? I don't know. There's so many things. Honestly, it's so hard. My Our playbook is like 100 pages long. Mm -hmm. But I think, okay, so my, my starting premise when we're thinking about our design is happiness. I want you to walk into a huckle tree space and to be like, wow. And by the way, 10% of people will hate it. But 90% might be like, this space is beautiful. And that's what I want to do because I don't want to be for everyone. I don't want to be for everyone. I think if you build something that tries to appease and appeal to everyone's tastes, you end up building something bland. You know, for me, Huckle Tree is rainbows. It's vibrant. It is. I don't know if you've seen any of our newest faces. It's, I haven't yet, but I should Oh my go God, and you need to come. So, you know, they are a little bit... Um, psychedelic? <laughs> psychedelic. <laughs> <laughs> They're psychedelic. Um, but with moments of calm, because I don't want us to be overloaded and kind of overly stimulated all the time, but there are definitely moments where you walk in, where you enter, where there's rainbow and there's color. I love color. You know, I love color. So yeah, I don't know. That's the starting thing. You know, you are office design. I can tell you, you know, put the reception here and make it like this and make sure that you don't have meeting rooms near open plan space and make sure you have enough bathrooms and the Wi-Fi needs to be really good. Basically, I'm reading off everything that was in our feedback or survey just now. You know, there's things, there's stuff that are like realities, um, but the juicy stuff, like the real stuff about building an office is make it somewhere that people are happy to come to every day. Mm -hmm. And that is not about where you place the bathroom. Mm. It's about what does the bathroom look like? What does it feel like? How, what's my experience of using this bathroom or this meeting room or whatever it might be? How do, how do you feel, you know? Places, physical spaces have such an impact on us. The built environment basically dictates how we feel, you know, when we're going into these spaces. Mm. They impact us. So I want people to like enjoy. Yeah, no, for sure. Um, Thinking back when I was employed mm. <laughs> and the two different spaces that I've worked in, one was, you know, an old sort of mused house, very much like a home. So there were desks, but it had more, you know, it had a, a really nice kitchen. It had like a meeting room. It felt very cozy. And as a result, when we worked well together, we worked very well together because it just felt, it felt very comfortable. And then in contrast, there was another role that I had and I was going in, it was a beautiful building in itself, but the office space, it was, all of it was completely open plan with lots of, there weren't cubicles, but there were desks together and there were bright colors, but it felt suffocating. It wasn't even clinical. I think they try to add fun elements but it just wasn't working mm. um it just i don't know it, was, it felt suffocating it felt like we were in this box together there wasn't anything to try to create a sense of community or, or innovation or creativity of any kind you're mm. just sort of there as a cog in a machine it's really easy to get it wrong it's a reality. It's really easy to get it wrong. I, also, we don't always get it right. There are spaces of ours that are much more conducive to like mm. the, that, those feelings of um, uh, belonging and of community and of productivity and of joy than others. Um, but I'll tell you something. I don't like offices to feel like home. So what you were saying about the first place that felt like a home, that gives me kind of you know, it makes the hairs stand up on my arms. I don't want to feel like I'm working in someone's home and I don't want people to feel in Huckletree that they're working in their home. I don't mind if they feel like they're working from the best hotel ever because I'm. that's great if our hospitality standards mm. are at that level. But I don't, you know, I don't like when I see people with their shoes off. No, we're in a professional <laughs> environment. Put your shoes on. Mm -hmm. So It's funny you say yeah. that about that because what became increasingly obvious was... It was run a bit like a family, but work is not family. Work is a team. Work is like a sports team. Yes. It's not like a family. It's when not, you're good, you're on was, my team. It was that sense of mom and dad, and you would be basically at the whim of emotions in the house, as opposed to having some kind of structure and where you're kind of progressing. So it's funny that you've really kind of hit the nail on the head that it shouldn't feel like a home. 
it shouldn't be but work is not your family no there's a mm. there's a you know we all have to be different people at home than at work I mean if I turned up to work how I turn up at home when my children are mucking around and I'm screaming at them and like my inner demon comes out because I've just you know as parents at some point we're pushed over our limit I can't do that at work and and by the same token I can't kind of slump around and put my feet up at work like I would at home so mm. it's different different places for different things mm. talking about having a family so let's get into that question of balancing work and balancing family the old question the old question that no man ever gets asked so yes <laughs> well first of all how do you feel about the question I think it's a great question you know I think that uh I don't I don't love it when men ask me that question and especially when it's the first and the only question that they ask me like there's so many other things to talk about first um but woman to woman you know and especially kind of in the context that that we're in and I think it's an important question. Mm. Um but do we have the answer? That's the thing. I think you know it's so hard any any woman that's running a business and has children you know, you, you probably feel the same way as I do. We don't have like a playbook on how to build a business and and raise a family. I I often have one kid in my arm when I'm on a call or you know I'm making a meal for a kid when I'm on a call or last week I was in New York and I was running around town to meetings with like various people that were very surprised that I had two children in tow there's no playbook and I feel like I'm constantly rushed and stressed so what I really try to do is put as much structure into my life as possible um so there are times where I know I'm going to be home I know every day I have to be home at 6:30 because I do my son's homework with him I build a menu for my children's lunches, breakfast, dinners for all their meals because if it's not me who's preparing them, I want to know what they're eating and I want to be prepared and I need to have the right ingredients in the fridge and I want to make sure that they get a healthy variety of meals. I have Excel spreadsheets for their weekly activities, for their holiday plans. You know, it, it runs the risk of all falling apart if mm. I'm not super super structured and coordinated with it. So that's my that's my reality. and that helps me not feel like i'm running around like a headless chicken. So this is something i identify with when you're saying well if i'm not doing those things then and if i'm not on top of it then things are just going to fall apart. I think for me that's the crux of the problem because you've got the motherhood on your shoulders beyond when they're babies. and i think that's where for a lot of female entrepreneurs female leaders that's the part where they cannot stop like it's on you that if you're not doing those things you can't park it and give it to someone else and in my view i think that m- emotional labor the mental load needs to be shared and not just with one other person your husband your partner but amongst a group of people and i think that's where until we figure out a solution to it women are going to struggle i'm lucky in the sense that my husband is very hands on last week for example i um you know i'm in a boot so i had an, a sports accident and like apparently tore four, four ligaments in my ankle in one in one go oh. i thought it was two they just told me yes it was four but you know i really couldn't move for the whole week and my husband stepped in and did everything So and it's hard for him like he works crazy hours but you know he makes it work we make it work so I'm very lucky I'm sure you are too. Um and I'm also lucky because I have a nanny. I have a nanny for my kids. You know childcare is really fucking expensive. There's no it doesn't matter what you do. It doesn't matter if they're in crash or nursery or you have a nanny or you have a no pair. It doesn't make a difference. It's really really expensive. Um and that's a personal choice. but i have worked to where i've got to and i choose to spend a portion of my income on childcare because i want to keep working i love the values that i'm setting for my boys i love showing them that a mother can go out as a woman run a business build a business and create something that has impact just as much as the father can mm. and that for me outstrips my need to not spend part of my income on childcare so you know i don't have all the answers but 100% you're right there that it's not feasible it's not feasible to be a working mother if you don't have a team of people around you and that team could be your family your friends 
childcare, etc., who help. It's impossible to do at all. <laughs> it's there's no such thing. I think the 90s definitely lied. And we're finally beginning to see that. It's just not, not Yeah, and happening. let's be realistic about that. Like, yes. let's not, I don't want to tell everyone you can do it all. Mm. Like, you know, something has to give. Mm. Something has to give. I, you know, I don't spend as much time with my kids as my friends spend with their kids. When I look at, you know, our, our uh, my, my son has an incredible group of um, friends. And or, as mums, we've all become really close as well. And I feel guilty because they're going to football matches and they don't forget to send, you know, the little ones into the nursery with with their packed lunches, which I've done. And, you know, there's all these things that I'm not doing well enough because something has to give. Mm. So let's not say you can do it all because you can't. We can't. No one can. You cannot. You factually cannot build a business, do it, you know, with complete ambition, put everything into it and be as good a mum as your friend who isn't running a business. You mm. factually can't but you have to choose what's important for you. Mm. So it's always the mum guilt though, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> never doing enough. Yep. Never doing enough at work and never doing enough. A hundred percent. For your kids. A hundred percent. But I also think I'm a really good mum. I do. So I think, okay, I'm not going to be the mum that's going to travel to Enfield on a Friday afternoon to watch his football match. I'd love to, but hey, I can't. But I am going to be the mum that on the weekend, my phone is off. And I'm going to teach you about things that are important to me and important to us. And I'm going to give you life lessons and we're going to enjoy our time together. I think so. it's about being intentional. Yeah. With what you choose to do and what you choose not to do. And knowing that, yes, there's certain things that you just simply can't, but you will make up for it in another area. I mean, I was literally shocked because I remember on Friday, my son did have a football match in Enfield. I, I don't know if it was Enfield, but the postcode, in my mind, it was Enfield, but it's definitely outside of London. And um, somebody wrote on the class WhatsApp group, so who's going to the match? And I, I kind of laughed to myself. I laughed out loud. I was like, obviously no one's going to the match. It's Friday afternoon and it's in Enfield and we're in central London. But actually there were a few mums who could go and then I felt really bad because then I was like, fuck, this is the reality. It's like, I'm so out of tune with how much other mums are present for their children that I laughed at the possibility of some mothers supporting their children in this match. So mum guilt. Mm. Yeah. It's hard. I mean, I don't, as you said, I don't have the right answers at all. Women have entered the workforce, paid workforce, not that long ago. So... There are some teething problems <laughs> with how we integrate women into work and having their roles as mothers as well. So I feel like we're the guinea pigs. Yeah. <laughs> Hopefully it's a great feeling. Easier. No, but it's or true. The it's next like generation. That. Yeah. Mm, the lessons. I think it will be. I actually do think it will be. And I think COVID has sped up a lot of it because I think that um, we recognize now that it wasn't sustainable how it was before. But there are a lot of people still sending, you know, they, when, we, when it comes to flexibility, which is what really women really, really need, there are companies that are sending their workforce back into the office, not sending, demanding. Yeah, so don't work with those companies. It's easier said than done, though. Well, it is, but you have to make choices. And again, I'm a proponent of working from the office, but I don't think it has to be five days a week even one day a week at home or, or just, I'm going to come in every day, but I'm going to come in at 9.30 because I want to drop my kids to school. I do that. And by the way, it's fucking embarrassing for me to walk into my office at 9.30 when everybody else gets there at 9 a.m. But I would give that opportunity to anyone else who wanted to drop their kids at school and I would understand it. So although it's embarrassing and I find myself kind of, eh, sorry, I'm so late guys, mm. but no, because the more important thing is that you know that you're working in a place where dropping your kids at school is acceptable. So you still struggle with that, with the perception of, oh, I'm turning up at 9.30, but everyone else is here at 9. I do. I do struggle with it's that. It's so hard to eliminate that from, like, even yourself knowing, being consciously aware that it's not necessary and you need to, you still kind of beat yourself up about it. I do. And because I, I don't think that anyone other than a few people know that even if I'm there at 9.30, I spend my waking life living, breathing, working, advancing Huckletree. Mm. So I feel like if I turned up at 9.30, you know, I've had a nice lie in, 
which I have, and I'm up at fucking 5 a.m. every day, <laughs> and I'm the last one in the office. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it is what it is. Mm. Yeah, it's this idea of visibility that somehow that equates to productivity and being passionate and being committed. And that's just not the case at all. One thing, actually, this leads me on. One thing I heard you speak on a podcast about was people pleasing. Can you talk me about? Can you talk to me about that? <laughs> can I talk to you about people pleasing? Mm -hmm. Don't do it. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's the reason. I look. I um. I have an incredible mother who was a refugee came here and built her life and then got divorced very young with two kids and, you know, was never anyone who did anything except work her ass off to try and put food on the table for us. So that's my, um, role model. Um, but equally she was a mother who was like, be polite, be a good girl. And there's a danger in that, that I kind of felt like I had to be polite. And that if I wasn't polite, I wasn't going to be liked. And I, I don't want to feel like that anymore. Like I am always going to be a kind person, but I need to be able to do what I need to do and say what I need to say. And you're not going to like everything that I say. And you're not going to agree with all of my actions. But that's a reality of running a business, right? I think that running Huckletree has brought that side out of me. Hmm. So you, you physically can't please all the people all the time when you are running a business. There are hard decisions that you have to make every single day. And even the easy decisions, not everybody is going to get on board with. So in the end, you just kind of end up being like, well, fuck it. Like, I'm not a people pleaser anymore. I'm just factually not a people pleaser anymore. So this is where I am. Was there a specific moment or situation where you're like, okay, I have to stop doing this? Or was it a gradual realization? I think the past few years where we have had to go through numerous structural and team changes and where I have had relationships, you know, the, the struggle has been very, was very overwhelming at times with how do I do this when I have a relationship with this person? And I think the reality kind of came to me that, um, I'm, I'm not heartless. I'm never going to be a heartless, cruel person, but I am somebody who has taken money from other people to build a business. And my responsibility is to those people to give them returns on their investment. And so as hard as it is for me to go through these kind of processes with, with different individuals where I have relationships with them, I have to do it. And maybe it shouldn't even be me, you know? When you say That's, relationships, what do you mean? Look, I've been running Huckletree for 10 years. I have people that I've worked with for years, mm. you know? And where, when the time comes to part ways and that time is instigated by you as the business and you have a a relationship with that person, that is something that I have struggled with. And that is something that I've had to overcome. Because if you work with me at Huckletree, there will be a moment, most likely, where the right course of action is for us to no longer work together mm -hmm. for whatever reason. And, you know, all good relationships come to an end. You have to be comfortable with that, with that and I have to be comfortable with that. But for a long time, I was very uncomfortable with that. I was uncomfortable with letting people go. Mm. That's been part of my own journey of like becoming a leader. Where do you think that comes from for you? I don't know. It's a really good question. Mm. I mean, I, I had just thought that that's part of being a woman. <laughs> Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe other women are much more able to be like, you were a great player whilst you were a great player and now we're going to say goodbye. But it's taken me longer to get there. You talked about raising money early on in your venture for Huckle Tree. Yeah. Talk me through that time. Um... I, do you know what? It ties in a lot with this people pleasing thing and kind of just general like imposter syndrome. I think it's hard for, I mean, it was definitely hard for me as a first time entrepreneur with no knowledge of how this was done and no confidence in myself, not a lack of confidence, just not a, an apparent confidence to go and ask people for money. You know, it was just, it was very challenging for me. And also the world was very different. So how I was spoken to as a female founder 10 years ago if somebody fucking spoke to me like that right now, I would literally pick myself up and just say, thank you and walk out of their office. End what of. happened? What did they say to you? People that wouldn't address me and would address, I was working with um, a friend of mine who uh, had kind of come on board as a co-founder to help me 
start the business and raise the money. I mean, he was never an operational co-founder, which is, I don't think ever a good idea. I've now realized, but you know, you know, he came on board to help me raise the money and we would be in these meetings and by all, you know, for all intents and purposes, the business is mine. The idea is mine. It's going to be me who's running this business forward, but I wouldn't be addressed in those meetings and he would be addressed things like that or questions around maternity leave and my policies on paying myself during maternity leave, you know, just things that are unacceptable. Mm -hmm. Those are my boundaries. I'm working my fucking ass off. You're not going to ask me what I'm paying myself during maternity leave. I don't even think it's legal. So, you know, I wouldn't accept things today that I accepted 10 years ago. And the world is not accepting of things today that the world was accepting of 10 years ago. But that aside, it was also hard because um, if I was raising money today, so if, if today I said, you know what, I need to go and raise money for Huckle Tree or, you know, for a future venture or whatever it might be, I have the confidence in myself. I have the confidence in myself to look at someone across the table and say, this is a great opportunity for you to be involved in. Because obviously if I'm doing it, I think that, you know, it's my business. I'm, I hope I think that. Um, but I didn't have that confidence then. You know, it was like, kind of like, oh my God, I'm asking this person for their money. Fuck. I don't see it that way anymore. Mm. So it was just, it was challenging for me to go and raise the first round. And then every kind of subsequent round became easier. And today I'm a different person. So... Well, it's, it's collecting that evidence, isn't it? When you're first starting out, you, you don't have the proof that you can get to the place where you believe that you can get it to. Whereas bit by bit, you're seeing, well, I've raised this money. I've built this business to the stage. Yeah. And bit by bit, you begin to collect evidence of your success mm. and your abilities to deliver. And I think that very early stage is so hard because you have to go on faith. You have to go on yeah. hope, a dream. And that's why I don't understand people who put money into like seed rounds. I don't get it. I, I'm just like, how do you know? Unless they're a serial entrepreneur, unless mm -hmm. they've done it before. I mean, look, I say that, but there was um, one angel investment that I did do that was a seed round, but I knew, you know, I looked at this, this, this team and I just thought, you're fucking amazing. But in, unless you have that conviction, I think you have to have that conviction if you're putting money into someone's seed round because it's so early and a million things might go wrong. And if you don't have the right team, then it will just all fall apart mm. very quickly. Well, it is the team. You're investing into the founder or founders. Yeah. So having that confidence, sometimes bravado, sometimes a dream like convincing the people that yeah but you know that as women we're very bad at that so men are much more capable of coming in and kind of projecting the the, the unicorn that their company is going to become over the next sort of you know whatever few years and as women we're much more conservative you know we project what we think we can achieve maybe we'll add a little extra to it but we're not going to do something crazy mm. and so investors believe the men and they back the men because that's where the hopes and dreams are well, it's the unconscious bias and, you know, you trust people more if they look like you. So yeah. if there aren't that many female investors, then it's going to be harder for to invest into somebody who looks different than you. I'm not defending it. I think it's that's the reality yeah, that but, women but, are up against. But I also think that as women, if we want to stand a chance against, you know, men, um, we need to be a little bit more brave in our projections. We need to not feel the need to be so conservative, right? Mm -hmm. It's very much like, I can't overpromise. I want to underpromise and overdeliver. but then we're the only ones doing that. And then the people that overpromise get the investment. Mm -hmm. So I think there's a lesson there for us also. Mm -hmm. So as a female founder raising today, what advice would you give her? I would say get a male co-founder. I'm kidding. <laughs> well, I'm kind of not kidding because it's a reality. Like you're, you're probably more likely to get investment if you have a man sitting with you at the table. It's a fucking reality. Mm. But what proper advice would I give um, that isn't so demoralizing? I would say, um, I would say that you need to have confidence in yourself and that you need to have confidence in what you're building. And I think that's half the battle. I really think that's half the battle. I think if as women we had the confidence level that men have, that we would be closing that gap faster. I'm not saying it's it's our issue. 
it's our fault, but I'm saying that there's a role that we can play also in making sure that we're not positioning ourselves as less worthy of investment. We have to work with what we've got. And I think that's what women are good with, good at. Our superpower is adjusting. <laughs> and in order to exist and be successful in a man's world, we have adjusted and that's what we have been good at. And I'd love to reach a stage where that's not the case and that men and women can be successful in their own way rather than following a pre determined path that has been set by male investors and investing into male founders, that women can find their own way of doing business. I'll tell you what, because we reached top three on the podcast this week, and actually I think it was 19 in the business section, I'm like, it's amazing. never been in the charts in this way before. Mm. And I started scrolling and I was looking for other female lead hosts counted three I counted three and one of well, not that I'm bragging but like I was one of the three and I was saying to my sister I said there needs to be another category because I feel like this is business like men's business <laughs> but it doesn't I don't want business for women it needs to be its own category altogether well I think if there was a category around um leading with empathy or leading with impact or um impactful entrepreneurship or something like that we would fucking be leading the way so the reality is in a business world that's very kind of dog eat dog yeah it's going to be the men that are that are leading that but if you look at the businesses that are more about in intuition about you know building something inclusive about um impact i think women would fare pretty well there well, this is what I'm saying, because business as we know it is built in one dimension. Yes. But it's changing. I do feel that's changing. I think if you look at B Corp, for example, you start to realize that countries around the world are recognizing this standard that businesses need to live up to that prove and demonstrate that they are about much more than just returning shareholder value that it's about building a lasting legacy to the communities, the environments, you know, that they go into, mm. no matter what they do. Mm. Um, and it looks at governance, it looks at, you know, your employees, it looks at all sorts of things. And I think that that is changing the way a lot of people think about business. Mm. So I, I think it will change over the coming years. I think it will shift. I think that, you know, businesses that are purely there for maximizing their own profits, you know, I just don't, I don't see that being the world that we're living in anymore. I think the world has got so many problems and so many issues and that there isn't endless space for these businesses to come in and, and, and just stream forward with their own agenda. Mm. Well, you did say you were an optimist. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Speaking of motherhood, every time I get a notification from Amazon on my phone, I realize that my son has snuck into my account and ordered himself some Prime, which is the new thing, by the way. What's that? It's an energy drink. I literally, I've just had a delivery of like a crate of Prime to my house and my son has gone on and just what ordered it. <laughs> um, I guess our kids are just so small now that we oh, it will don't come. really it think will about come. that yet. But. He, my son takes my phone when I'm sleeping and tries to do the face unlock thing. I'm like, it doesn't work. <laughs> like, he literally tries <laughs> and then just, you know, just orders himself stuff wow. on Amazon. Very yeah. entrepreneurial. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Is that what you Very call it? Very <laughs> cheeky, creative, <laughs> problem solving. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Any, any strength, any skill has its opposite brother, sister. It's like two sides of the same coin. So everything that is a strength and everything that's a weakness has the opposite. Yes. And I think it's framing it and seeing it from a different perspective. Oh, so you're talking about Jack and his Amazon tendencies. Well, I'm talking about all of them. I'm talking okay. about him, you know, being sneaky and figure out, it is problem solving. It's what we call chutzpah. Yeah. Do you know what that means? Like he knows what he wants and he's going to get it. Yeah. So I think that's good. Look, one of the lessons that I teach him in life is you don't ask, you don't get. So for example, 
I was livid a few weeks ago because they have had, you know, a term so far, where are we? We're in mid-October and they've got football fixtures every week and my son hadn't been selected for one. And I was livid. I was like, look, I know he's not the best footballer, but put him in one fucking fixture. And Jack said, please don't go and talk to my sports teacher. Please don't. He was like squirming on his car seat on the way to school. And I said, no, I'm going because you know what? You don't ask, you don't get. And I went and spoke to the teacher and I said, listen, Jack's really good in goal. He plays goalie for his league. So I know you don't know that because he's not going to tell you, but I'm going to tell you and I want you to put him in a fixture. And he did. And he was great. Mm. And you know, that's a life lesson. I always say to Jack, whether it's about I want to apply for this position of eco warrior on my school council, or I want to make sure that I'm doing my presentation on this day because I can't do it next day. Whatever it might be, you don't ask, you don't get. And that's like the biggest life lesson that I'm giving him right now. So actually the fact that he's stealing my phone and ordering himself, whatever his little heart desires on Amazon, which is only going to get sent back anyways, I don't care. Mm. You know, I care that he is making what he wants to happen happen mm -hmm. so yeah I guess you're right well it's the same our daughter she's very loud and very outspoken she will say to you what she's displeased with and she will ask for what she wants to ask and it is exasperating exhausting and I sometimes have to hold myself back from not diminishing that because I think I was like that when I was a kid where I was just like, oh, just ask. And like people have to say no to me so many times before I would give up. And I think that really helped me in life. And I don't want her to just become compliant. A hundred percent. If you don't ask, you don't get. And especially as a woman, you know, if the girls, sorry, if the women on my workforce didn't come and say, I want a promotion, I'm due a promotion, look at what I've achieved, I've hit all my targets and we're coming up to annual reviews. They wouldn't get them because they don't get handed out in any business around the world. You have to, you have to demonstrate what you're worth. You have to take what you are worth. Mm. So I agree with you, um, especially for women. No, for sure. Sadly though, even though women ask and they do ask mm. much more than people have made out for salaries, promotions. Mm -hmm. They're just told no more often. Well, I mean, I can imagine. So it's almost like you have to do even more. Yeah, you have to. Mm -hmm. Look, as a woman, we need to work, you know, I don't know, double, triple, quadruple as hard as men, but we need to, and we do. And I see that, mm -hmm. honestly. It's I, not right though. It's not right, but you know what they say, you wanna, you wanna get a job done, hire a mother. Like, we're fucking efficient. <laughs> We are because we have to be, I have to be at home at 6.30. I have to, I'm not going to come into work on days that I'm dropping them to school before 9.30. I can't, I can't be in two places at once. We have to be efficient. Plus it's like, you know, sometimes, you know, you, your day, you know, you get something happens and you have to go home, you have to be there, whatever. So I, I genuinely believe that. It doesn't mean I don't like working with men. I like, you know, I love working with men. I love men. I love men. Um, I do, but I think that women, you know, I think, I think parents are efficient, especially mothers. Mm. I think we have to be very careful though, because yes, women are very efficient, but they pay the price. There is a cost to mm. it. And that comes to exhaustion, not taking care of yourself, not putting your needs first Yep, in the desire to be efficient so yes whilst it's like if, if you want something done hire a mother but like also you know give her a break you're right you're 100 percent right and i see you know there are some very strong women around me that are kind of always volunteering to do more work mm -hmm. because they're good at it and because they know that they can make it work and because probably they know that you know eight times out of 10, they can get it done better than <laughs> other people around. But they it's do. true. Mm -hmm. So we all need to stop doing that. And we need to, um, you're right, give them a break. I think it's recognition. I think it's being recognized for the work you do, both at home, in the office, in the business field. I think recognition is important to recognize women. Is that your, that's your love language? I don't know if it is that. I think 
do I want to be recognized? Yeah, sure. I mean, status, money, wealth. I, I accept that I want those things. But I don't think this is about me. Maybe more about how I felt about my mum mm. and the unf- unfairness. I think recognition to women in general for the contribution they make to society that just goes unsaid. I think it's that. And I think as a result, women like myself work extra hard because you do get recognized, but not to the level. Yes, to compensate. Yeah. So I think what I want is for society to change, to give more recognition to women rightful recognition but what does that recognition look like to be meaningful because we don't just need you know a pat on the back we don't need something condescending financial okay so raising as you said is very difficult for women so i think financial recognition um i think it is verbal recognition too saying yes you did a good job to be seen i think is very important because a lot of the work women do is invisible labor so i think being seen i think it's about i think those two things that i can come up with now what do you think it should be i don't have the answer to that Mm. i don't know two questions i wanted to ask you about the best piece of business advice you've received we receive so much business advice that's like Generic. Generic and obvious and doesn't really move the needle. I think um, one thing that really, that my brother actually kind of taught me in very early days of him um, starting a business before the business that he now runs. My brother is an incredible human being and entrepreneur and he runs a business called Zen Cargo. But previous Prior to that, he was um, kind of ideating another concept in a different industry. And he put uh, significant time into this ideation phase where if he would um, kind of choose that it wasn't the right industry business route for him, uh, and should he walk away, that I might feel like, whoa, you've just invested, you know, however much time in your life. But I think, you know, watching him do that and watching him ultimately make the decision that it wasn't the right course for him and that he should step away now before he got too invested in it, I think was a really good piece of advice because it made me realize we're not tied to our ideas. So you have an idea, you develop it, you run your business plan, your business model, you'll speak to lots of people, get their advice, you know, really understand whether this idea has legs or not. And more often than not, by the time we've done all that, we're so emotionally invested in it that we think we have to um, keep going and raise the first round and or you know do whatever we have to do. And, and, and even that extends to later on in running a business where you've raised investment, but maybe it's not going as you kind of had hoped or projected and, but you still feel like you need to, to, to move forward. So I think that there, for me, it's like, um, ending a relationship. Um, you know, when, when, um, you'd rather, you'd always rather end a relationship before you're too invested, whatever that might mean, you know, maybe before having children, whatever it could mean, you know, there's a moment in time where it's easier to walk away from a relationship than down the line. And I think that extends itself to business also. You know, you have an idea, you're going to do your due diligence, you're going to figure out if this is the right idea for you or not. But if it's not, do not be afraid to walk away and to find something that is the right idea for you because it's really hard running a business, even a business that you are passionate about, right? There are good times, there are really bad times. There's probably more challenging times than there are easier times. And you need to be committed. You need to be passionate about it and you need to really fully believe in the potential of this venture. Mm. So so I think that's, that's something that's really important, mm. I think. In psychology, they call it the sunk cost fallacy mm. where by investing your time and energies, you can only see what you have and what you're going to give up as opposed to what you potentially will gain from not having that thing or not being in that relationship anymore. It's such a good piece of advice. It's just cut your losses. Yes, and we have to make tough decisions and quitting is not all bad. Mm -hmm. I did a video called Quit or Grit, which is mostly 
talking about whether you should stay, whether you should quit your job, but I think it's applicable to businesses as well. It's a critical decision-making tool to realize when is the moment to walk away. Okay, that's useful. Mm. That's really useful. Mm. That's the thing. I think um, it's about that. It's about knowing that you can walk away if something isn't right for you and that you haven't wasted time. Mm. For sure. Looking back now, what advice would you give your younger self? I would probably tell my younger self not to go to university. Oh, really? Yep. And it's something that I think about a lot because I'm thinking ahead mm. to when my children finish school. I think the world is changing really, really rapidly in front of our eyes. And I question, I question whether, and it's, it, it depends on the individual, but for me as somebody who is very entrepreneurial, I wonder if I wouldn't have um, learned more faster had I just jumped into starting my own business. Look, I was, my university was amazing and I met, I made incredible contacts. I made great friends. The quality of the teaching was really high, but at that time it was still very, very theoretical. I did a business degree and it was very theoretical. And I can tell you, I've only used Porter's five horses once since I've left university or a mm. SWOT analysis twice maybe. And the rest is like in one ear out the other. I've learned everything else by running my own business. So I think if my children are entrepreneurial, or if I was going back to my younger self, I would probably say, don't go to university. But I'm also, I'm a very ambitious person. You know, I'm someone that wants to make something of my life. That's my, I just want to make something of my life. I want to have an impact. I want to have a legacy. I want my children to be proud of me. I want to be proud of myself. Mm -hmm. So university was great fun. And I made amazing friends and learned a little bit along the way and smoked loads of cigarettes. <laughs> but you know, was it, was it worth it? Mm. I think, but then I have the mindset of what uni was like, you know, however many years ago. Mm. Do you think that if you didn't go to university, you would have progressed faster in business? Look, it, it's, it's like a kind of sliding doors theory, right? Because I went to university and then I moved to New York and then I worked in the film production company and then we moved to the first WeWork and then I came across the concept. I would not have had the idea myself six years previous to that, six years prior to that. So it's hard to know. Maybe I would have had another idea. Who knows? But generally as somebody who is very entrepreneurial, you know, I think, it, I just think if my children come to me in sort of 10, 15 years time and they say to me, hey, ma, I don't want to go to university. I have a business idea. I would say, oh, I would evaluate the viability of their business idea. But if I thought it had legs, mm. you know, I'm not going to let them do it for some shit idea that's going to last one week and then they have no university to go to. But if it was a really genuine business idea, it doesn't have to be a unicorn, but just something that is viable, mm -hmm. then I think I would back them to do that. Mm. I often think about education because I'm like my kids are now in school. Yeah. They're still young, but think about what I would want for them and how I believe human beings learn best. And it is out there in the real world, messing things up, you know, building things, things falling down, you know, in context. And I think what you're saying is that university wasn't in context it was theoretical it was ideas yeah and it was not it actually. was textbook it was textbook but we're trying to change that also so I don't know if you know this but we actually opened a Huckle Tree Innovation Lab at the university that I went to mm. just a few weeks ago and I think the main goal of that is to change that textbook approach to learning and really make mm. give real world context to entrepreneurship so in the lab we'll have you know all sorts of experienced, successful, um, sometimes unsuccessful entrepreneurs coming to kind of give their guidance, share their stories. And really you take entrepreneurship from being a concept that you study for a module in a business program to being something that actually is potentially a route in life that you might take when you leave university and that we can help you kind of accelerate. So, mm. so it's I interesting. That's the way that education needs to go about really understanding about creativity and innovation and if you want to go down you know the doctor route 
you know that you need to study yes. medicine, you need, know you need to go and do X courses and maybe have some practical and then go back and learn some more. But if you want to go down the entrepreneurial route, that structured program may not necessarily be the right one for you and you need to have a different education. But look, there can be brilliant entrepreneurship programs and there are brilliant entrepreneurship programs around the world but no matter how good they are they are never as good as you being out there working in or running your own business they can't Mm. be because they're not real life they're Mm. not real world so so what would be your advice to corporates so companies that want to foster innovation within their teams and I'm asking through the lens of what you've learned at Huckle Tree and office space in particular. Well, first of all, I would say come and work from a space like Huckle Tree. That's not a plug. It doesn't have to be Huckle Tree, but I do think we're pretty good at what we do. But I think when you're working there, and again, you're in this environment where there are so many ambitious people with revolutionary ideas and, and great teams underneath them, that is naturally going to elevate the performance of your own team. So that for me is like a no brainer. Um, that's, the, that's the starting thing because really I think what, what large corporates, what it's all about is entrepreneurship. It's about making everyone think and feel like a business owner, but you can't get there unless A, they're totally engaged and, and the office plays a big part in that and B, that they know how to you know, be entrepreneurial in their own fields and their own job roles. So what's next for you? It, it's funny because I feel like it's a misnomer of entrepreneurship that there's always something exciting happening. Like what's next for me is I'm going back to the office. I'm going back to the office today. I'm going back to the office tomorrow. I'm going back to the office the day after. And I think that, you know, I, I'm saying that because that is a reality of entrepreneurship. If you're not somebody that can be consistent, that can be resilient, um, and that wants to see something out for, you know, through the long game, then this is, this job isn't for you. So of course, like exciting things are happening the whole time. We're launching, you know, a bunch of new locations. I'm really excited about that. But the reality is, is that I'm just still going to be here working away at building this business. That's what's next. What's your favorite space? Um, can't ask me that it's like asking me which is my favorite child (laughs) yeah um Oxford Circus (laughs) I really like Oxford Circus I'll go and check it out yeah look I think they're all beautiful and my teams are great in all of them and they all have really active um ecosystems and members from a design perspective Oxford Circus is the latest one and it was the first one um after COVID where we could really kind of just start from a completely um fresh kind of canvas and say what do we want to do here and it's the first one where our physical brand really matches up to how our brand manifests in the digital world so i'm really proud of it from a from an aesthetic and and um from the perspective of how we're approaching workspace design mm. well for anyone who's listening go and check it out <laughs> yes Gabby, thank you so much. It's been such a pleasure talking to you. Likewise. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you. You've been listening to Anatomy of a Leader podcast. I'm your host, Maria Vorostovsky. If you haven't already, please follow and subscribe this podcast and I'll see you in the next episode.